options for furloughed staff webinar. With COVID-19 continuing to play uh, an impact, impact people across uh, the world, uh, many UK organisations are taking advantage of the government's uh, job retention scheme and of uh, furlough staff. Uh, the objective of this webinar is to explain uh, what can be done within your Microsoft licensing agreements and to talk through some of the implications and risks of uh, potentially downgrading or removing uh, licenses from users. We'll also briefly talk about how we can help you uh, deploy cloud workloads uh, to enable uh, remote working and talk through our quantum tool and service to see if we can help uh, reduce costs um, with uh, Microsoft 365 suites and Azure. So the uh, we're going to go through um, uh, what's likely what we can do with your Microsoft license agreement, the technical considerations, uh, our fast track service, which is how um, we help um, deploy on, uh, online services, and as I said, um, um, uh, how to reduce costs with uh, our quantum tool set. So uh, I'm going to cover uh, what's possible within your Microsoft license agreement. So not all uh, agreements have the flexibility to immediately reduce licenses. Um, the enterprise agreement, which many of our customers have, uh, is, is uh, a, a pretty rigid agreement type. So um, typically, you will prepay for the year at the start. <clears throat> so um, it isn't possible to reduce online services up and, uh, until you reach uh, your, your next anniversary. So you, you'll have prepaid uh, for a set number of licenses. You can make license reservations throughout the year uh, for any online services to increase. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, you have to wait until the agreement anniversary until uh, you can decrease those licenses. Uh, On-premises uh, perpetual licenses uh, can't be reduced at all in a perpetual agreement. Um, in an enterprise subscription agreement, they can be reduced, uh, but on the basis that obviously you're, you're no longer using that software. So if your usage has decreased, then you can, uh, in an enterprise subscription agreement, absolutely reduce uh, licenses there. Within um, an enterprise agreement, uh, either perpetual or non-perpetual, if you've got... Um, uh, enterprise online services only. So for example, uh, Office 365 or the M365 E3 or E5 suite, you can reduce um, quantities um, uh, as long as obviously they're not in use anymore uh, and uh, to a minimum of 500 users. With regards to payment options, if uh, uh, we've helped our customers um, put forward a business case to Microsoft um, for specific um, industries, so uh, retail, travel, and hospitality, um, uh, whereby Microsoft will, will provide um, spread payment options or even payment holidays for their annual um, bills. So within an enterprise agreement, typically costs are spread um, annually over a three-year term. Uh, if you're approaching one of those anniversaries and you've got a, uh, uh, an invoice to pay, it may be possible to maybe spread um, that annual invoice over maybe three or six months. So speak to your Bytes account manager. It's potentially something we can help you do if you do need to um, uh, you know, spread uh, that invoice over a number of months. With regards to the payment holiday, um, if you originally financed through Microsoft Finance, so um, DLL, um, uh, then there, there may well be options to take a three-month payment holiday. Um, uh, there's kind of two two options that we've we've seen put forward. Uh, either increase the the final rental and uh, keep to the same kind of 36 month term if that's uh, how you financed it, or um, extend the payment term. The agreement itself doesn't extend, but ex extend the payment term by the number of months that you've taken the payment holiday. With regards to CSP, CSP um, the cloud solution provider program. Uh, does provide a lot more flexibility to amend licenses. So um, you can both add licenses and reduce them uh, and you're charged basically by the day. So uh, you could have a CSP agreement alongside your enterprise agreement. And in fact, that's, that's what we actively encourage our customers to do because it then provides a lot more flexibility around kind of seasonal workers or, or where you may need to increase and decrease on a temporary basis. Um, 
you have the ability to do this through, through the Bytes portal or through uh, our, the Bytes Cloud dashboard. Um, uh, and like I say, the, the, the um, costs of, of the online services are basically calculated on a daily basis. So um, regardless of, of how you uh, increase or decrease, um, uh, you, you'll only be charged for, uh, for that day. As you'll see from the graphics on screen here, um, both a CS, a CSP, as I said, um, does allow you to increase um, and decrease uh, whenever you like. The EA is pretty static where um, you can stay the same or only increase up until the anniversary point, um, at which point you can obviously decrease based on uh, how many uh, licenses you need. So I'm going to hand over to Bruce. Uh, Bruce is going to talk through the technical considerations and, and potential risks uh, in uh, um, either downgrading a license or indeed removing a user entirely. Bruce, over to you. Hi all, thanks, uh, John. Um, yeah, so my name is Bruce Knight. I'm a cloud solutions specialist at Bytes. Um, and as John mentioned, I will um, go through some of the technical considerations. So. Um, I guess, you know, some of the options and things to think about um, whether or not you choose to either downgrade a license, so change a user from a, an Office 365 E3 to an E1 plan, for example, or you want to completely remove that license. So, um, you know, of course, these things have implications um, and a couple of things or considerations to think about when uh, you decide on one of those two different options. Um, I'll talk through them in a little bit more detail, but generally, uh, I guess if you, you're furloughing staff, um, typically you'd want to block access, so um, they shouldn't be working. Uh, and to do that, um, depending on whether or not you're syncing um, your AD on-prem into Office 365, um, the, the quickest way to, I guess, block access would be change, change the password of the user, uh, disable that AD account on premise um, that would sync then to the service um, in Office 365 or Azure AD uh, and then not allow that user to sign into any Office 365 services. Um, you don't have to change the password but you know that's a more immediate way because if you just disable the account on prem that could take you know a couple of minutes for that sync still to happen the Delta sync from the Azure AD Connect service into, into Office 365 and then uh, block sign in. Um, if you're just accessing P65 services um, with cloud identities, then you can go to the users, select multiple, use PowerShell to um, block the sign-in status of that user. Uh, another way you could do it is, um, you know, create a security group, add all your furloughed staff into that security group, uh, and then apply a conditional access policy to block access to any services in Office 365. Um, Course, that's only you know if you have access to conditional access policies um, but that's another good way to, to easily manage a group of users and then uh, block access with the block rule in conditional access um, other things to think about is um, you know if you're going to to block access to that user um, out of offices for the for the employee that you're blocking access to so um, you know either get them to put their own out of office messages in before uh, you block access or you can as an admin um, set that so um, just go to the user account profile click on the mail um, tab and set an out of office uh, you might also want to think about um, forwarding mail to colleagues who, who may still be working um, just to keep an eye on what's going on if you know uh, there's any important emails that need to be addressed at least they're being forwarded it to a colleague or if you want uh, set delegate permissions for that mailbox to, to a colleague for example um, mailbox and OneDrive data, so obviously very important to think about um, depending on which way you go, whether you um, downgrading or removing licenses, there's some things to think about and we'll, we'll jump into uh, the detail around those two different options uh, on the next slide. Um, but certainly, you know, you want to retain that data so that when the user comes back to the office then you enable the account again. Uh, that they still have access to email and OneDrive content that was uh, in the service or existing prior to you disabling that account. Um, another, thing, another thing to think about is owner permissions uh, for things like you know, Microsoft Teams, Power Automate, uh, SharePoint, Power BI. So uh, typically it's 
it's good practice to have more more than a single owner on those uh, types of services. So, you know, for example, if you, you had a single owner and uh, for a team, uh, you furloughed that user, he's not checking mail or accessing any services, and you have somebody else who needs to get access to that team. Um, you know, obviously the owner is the person that would, would um, allow permissions to any additional users. Um, as an administrator, though, you could go in, um, add yourself as an owner, uh, and then add any other owners that you need to, but just things to think about, I guess, um, when you when you are furloughing staff. And then we'll jump into, you know, obviously licensing considerations. That, so the two options there are downgrade license, so um, from an E3 to an E1, for example, that could be Office 365, E3 to E1, or Microsoft 365, E3 to an F3, for example. Um, and of course, you know, every uh, organization has uh, different types of licenses. Uh, and so then depending on what you're going to do, uh, there could be implications. So, you know, if you, you are planning on taking any of these measures um, and you want to maybe have a discussion first with, with one of one of us, or one of the cloud solution specialists, um, good idea to maybe contact your bikes account manager have a call with us and, and we can you know walk you through some of those considerations in more detail but more specifically around what you're currently licensed for and what you're planning on moving to uh, but i'll cover a sort of generic scenario uh, in more detail and then of course the other option is remove the license altogether um, this is a bit more difficult to manage um, you know you need to be aware of a lot more in terms of uh, when you remove that license what's going to happen to mailboxes uh, onedrive data uh, that user's account and so uh, then you know when you then re-enable or add a license back to the user um, how do you recover the data uh, and so you know a bit more difficult to manage that uh, easier to just downgrade a license because that mailbox stay active um, and the data will still remain where it is um, so you know definitely things to consider but let's jump into then uh, the first scenario around downgrading a user's license so um, you know from a from an E3 to an E1 or an E5 to an E3 um, whatever that scenario is um, you know there's certainly things you would want to think about before you just move or downgrade a license um, so if we had a look at a scenario where we took a user from a, an Office 365 E3 license to an Office 365 E1 license um, you know, things to think about there is the differences between those two and what features you may or may not have once you do that. Um, so, so things around information governance. So if you have retention policies in place, uh, litigation hold on mailboxes, uh, or plan on using an inactive mailbox features, um, those, those don't apply when you move from an E3 to an E1. Um, so there are ways for you to um, scope those out. So if you have a current retention policy in place that's covering all your users, and you know on an E3, and you downgrade some of those, you you know you could um, modify that retention policy to exclude those recipients. I guess as those users won't be um, you know sending any email or um, accessing their mailboxes. Um, you, you know, you could take them out of retention and then when you put the license back up to an E3, um, just remove that exclusion when you get back into, uh, when they come back to the office. Um, but certainly things to think about and how you manage that. So probably want to set up a mail-enabled security group uh, or use an Office 365 group to, to exclude participants from a, a retention policy. And the same goes for um, things like DLP and sensitivity labels. Um, you know, I guess if a user is not accessing any data, they're not going to. There's no real concern around DLP because they're not going to be, um, you know, sharing content, sending out emails. So um, if you remove them from those DLP policies um, and the, and you block access, for example, um, you know, you can just go in and modify those those policies from within inside the compliance center or security and compliance center. Um, mailbox sizes, so. You know, if you have a user, for example, that that's currently has a mailbox larger than 50 gigabytes, um, which I'm sure is very rare in most cases, but you know, it can happen. Uh, and then you decide to move them off of E3 to an E1, or even an F1, which which would be even smaller, so two gig mailbox on F1. Um, and you know, so take note of the mailbox size, um, because if you downgrade that license. Uh, and the, the mailbox is bigger, um, obviously there'll be restrictions for sender and fee, for example. Um, so, 
just just be aware of that uh, that fact as well when you when you are moving licenses down. There's, there's lots of reports that you can run to see mailbox sizes, and so as an administrator, maybe just just check up on those before before reducing the license. Um, also, another thing, I guess, if you're just downgrading and not removing the license, that mailbox remains active. So any out of offices or uh, out of office messages or forwarding rules that you apply to the mailbox will still run in the background, even though the, the user has been blocked sign in. Um, so, you know, if somebody sends that user an email, they get the out of office, uh, you know, the user's been furloughed, um, you know, please contact such and such a person. So it doesn't just kind of disappear or, or you know, return an NDA, for example. Um, no office apps. So if you know E3 to E1, you, you're certainly not going to have access then to the office applications themselves. So Excel Word PowerPoint, the the rich clients that you you know may have installed on on uh, the user's corporate device, or if they've had access to installed on their own personal device, and you uh, remove that license or uh, downgrade it, um, then the user will get that sort of pop-up or uh, product deactivated message and the bar across the top. So limited uh, restricted mode uh, for the office apps um, and which would be fine as well. I mean, you know, if they're not going to be doing any work. It's, it's, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. And then once you re sign or move their license back up to an E3 uh, and they sign in to office again, it will just reactivate. So, uh, but just, you know, be aware obviously that they wouldn't be able to use the office suites, um, it'll, it'll go down to limited or reduced state uh, once you change the license type. Um, and we just, you know, put this slide in, obviously, you know, I spoke around E3 to E1 um, and then other things to think about if you had to go from say an E3 to F3, uh, so some slight changes to, to the um, names of the different suites. Um, mailbox size, two gig, uh, so obviously, you know, very likely that a user may have a mailbox bigger than two gigabytes. So just think about that. Um, and the other piece there is the the OneDrive for business. So um, from a potentially five, five terabytes plus uh, OneDrive to a much smaller two gigabytes uh, OneDrive for business. Um, they still have, you know, most of the other capabilities there around Teams, Access, SharePoint. Uh, the other thing to think about as well is um, from a pooled storage perspective, an F3 uh, licensed user won't add additional storage to SharePoint, uh, Stream, and obviously where users are uploading files into Teams um, channels, there is that, that kind of comes out of your pooled SharePoint storage. So. Um, if you're if you're sort of nearing capacity um, from a SharePoint online perspective, and you did, you know downgrade a whole lot of users to to an F3 license, you know you're not going to get that additional storage uh, per user. So it's 10 gig per user you add for E1 and E3 licenses to the pool. Um, but if they're on an F3, they won't bring any additional storage to the pool. So moving on to the last scenario. So if you you know you decide you want to completely remove that license for a user, um, obviously you know um, a lot more things to think about in this scenario. Um, so once again, you know CSP customers have the most flexibility in terms of uh, down or uh, lessening in the amount of licenses you have, so reducing your subscription counts. Um, yes, I mean you know definitely you would not want to do in this scenario was you know delete the user account. So uh, remove the user license from the admin center, but keep that account intact, right? So block access, remove the license. Um, but then, you know, the sort of things to think about is that um, after 30 days, that mailbox will be deleted. Um, so within the 30 day period, you can still recover it, you know, by reattaching that license. Uh, but after 30 days, it's gone. Um, unless of course you, um, had retention policies on that, um, so that user was covered under retention policy or legal hold. Um, it would then go into an inactive mailbox, uh, and you could access those inactive mailboxes. You'd see them in the um, information governance section in Security and Compliance Center under retention. Um, it would also, you know, be able to be recovered or restored, um, but it needs, you know, PowerShell scripting to make that work. So, you know, say for example, you remove the license three months later, 
uh, you'd want to reactivate that user so sign the license again it would create a new mailbox you'd have to then recover the inactive mailbox into that user's new mailbox and merge the two together and so then you know they have all their data uh, from prior to when they went on to furlough it's just much more difficult to manage in that scenario um, also things to think about is um, if say for example it wasn't under retention um, you know things like e-discovery content search won't work on a de-licensed uh, mailbox um, uh, and also if uh, for example um, you know you don't have retention policies or you didn't have an e3 license prior and they weren't under retention uh, something else you could potentially do is um, convert that mailbox to a shared mailbox um, and that way I guess you know that that mailbox remains active and can still receive mail uh, whereas if you you know remove the license um, and that mailbox went into an inactive mailbox state it's no longer active so it won't send and receive email uh, out of offices won't work uh, forwarding rules um, you know not gonna not gonna work either so inactive mailboxes are just there to be searched and then later recovered for example uh, or for e-discovery purposes if you need to um, you know do a search across the mailbox and, and find some some emails for litigation purposes for example um, the, the converting a shared mailbox is is uh, you know something that I think a lot of uh, organizations do so you can you can take a mailbox convert it to shared give access to a colleague and then when they get back convert it back to a, a user mailbox uh, but also more admin intensive to do something like that rather than just sort of downgrade a license. Um, one draft for business is an interesting one. Um, so there's lots of sort of uh, um, you know things around what do you want to do with that data. So um, the data won't be deleted. So that deletion process only kicks off when you delete the account from Azure Active Directory. Uh, so if you just remove the license and you keep that account. Uh, and it's still showing up in, in active users, for example, without a license, uh, the, the, the data will remain in that user's uh, OneDrive site collection. Um, you can also, you know, extend, so for example, if you did delete the account, uh, it would, you know, after 30 days go into um, the typical 30 day retention period, but you can, you can set that in the OneDrive admin center to a maximum of 3,650 days. So if you're concerned and you're worried that something might happen, change the retention policy in the, the OneDrive admin center. Um, or you can use the compliance center and put retention on OneDrive, um, OneDrive folders for forever if you like. Um, so you could do that before removing the license as well. Um, and then if you need access to, to a user's OneDrive that's you know been um, disabled or on furlough, then you, you can, as an administrator, um, jump into the SharePoint admin site uh, and then you know go to additional options and click on uh, user profiles uh, and then manage site collection owners. So then you could add um, somebody else as an owner to that, that user's OneDrive for business. For example, they could get access uh, to those files if need be. Um, so certainly something you know, if, if you needed to uh, give access to somebody else's OneDrive, you can do even those accounts disabled. And to learn more, I've just included a link here. So this talks around that deletion process of OneDrive for business uh, and how, you know, that kind of works in the service. So just some more information for you to have a look at. And then lastly, um, you know, Microsoft's FastTrack has been around for many years. Um, Bytes are a FastTrack ready partner, so we're able to uh, assist customers um, deploying Microsoft 365 services, so um, onboarding into service, so core onboarding, uh, um, drive value and adoption, and then also help enable services. So for example, if you're looking to support remote work with Microsoft Teams, uh, and you're a little bit concerned around security and, go and governance, um, you know, we can help and assist, uh, have workshops around how to make sure that you're, you know, sort of doing the right things when you um, deploy Microsoft Teams to your users working from home. So just, you know, the, the typical sort of best practice uh, governance things to think about. Uh, and so, you know, Microsoft Teams is one example, but of course the Microsoft 365 Fast Track services are across the board in, in, um, in Fast Track. Uh, just contact your Bytes account manager and they can give you uh, some more information. Um, to qualify, you need a minimum of 150 licenses. Um, and so um, if you have that and you, you, you want some assistance, uh, you know, we will we'll help and assist. It will be remote. 
uh, assistance and guidance, best practice and tools to help you on your way. Um, so please do reach out to us if you're, if you're looking for some assistance there. Um, and that's me, thanks. Uh, and with that, I'll hand over to, to Dan. Super, thanks so much, Bruce. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Dan Cranebrink, and I'm responsible for our software, software asset management business here at Bytes. Um, and given today's topic, um, it seemed like a great opportunity to very, very briefly chat about um, our quantum tooling and offering. Um, quantum is our internal brand um, for our, our, our own IP. Um, and you know, it is very much 100% focused around helping our customers drive, around, uh, drive down their Microsoft cloud costs, public cloud costs. Um, and the reason why we put this together um, over the last sort of two or three years and made that large investment um, is to help customers with some key challenges. And I'm sure all of these will resonate with you today um, and kind of hopefully will speak to um, helping you identify um, usage across cloud um, or Microsoft cloud platforms um, when looking at furloughed staff. Um, but just to run through a couple of those challenges, you know, when I'm talking to customers, you know, the key one is lack of visibility. You know, customers really struggling to re report on how they're using 365 and indeed Azure and align those costs to particular stakeholders or services and more functional groups across the business. Um, they, most customers really struggle to understand sort of the different um, ways in which they can consume um, and pay for um, either 365 or Azure. For instance, you know, um, what level um, or subscription level of 365 or M365 should they go for based on their actual usage or their actual requirements? Or when we move into Azure, you know, what's better, um, a pay-as-you-go model um, or using perpetual usage, existing perpetual licenses, um, for example, hybrid benefit, or looking at the myriad of different options available for Microsoft around pre-purchase. So whether that be reserved instances, reserved capacity, um, et cetera. Um, so quite a lot of complexity there for customers to get their heads around. Um, when they do invest in those, um, uh, those models, it's about tracking that RO ROI. You know, is that continually um, you know, driving or, or sorry, is it continually looking like it's a, a you know, the, the right way for, the, for them to be consuming or procuring um, those licenses, sorry, those subscriptions? Um, and actually, are we better off or you guys better off reallocating them, dropping them down or swapping them around uh, to ensure that they're driving value. Um, and even when we kind of expose all this data, actually customers really struggle to actually act um, and change um, or make the relevant changes in the, in, in the portals, um, the Microsoft portals, whether that's lack of time, um, you know, lack of knowledge, or, or frankly willpower, um, I'm not sure, but that tends to be the general sort of trend that I see or that we see um, across our customers. So um, just very briefly, um, our quantum tool or tooling is kind of split into um, into two um, parts, 365 and Azure, as I've already said. Um, and the 365 component hooks into Azure AD um, and your 365 tenant or indeed tenants um, and effectively provides you guys and indeed us um, with complete visibility of um, how your users and how your organization is using um, the 365 product suite. And of course that covers your, your typical pro plus aspects, um, but we're also um, amalgamating a whole heap of data um, across all the other elements. So mailbox size, um, how much OneDrive is in use um, and how many files are being transferred. You know, how are your users leveraging Teams? Um, you know, how many calls or meetings or instant messages are they doing? How are they leveraging SharePoint, um, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of information is stored in that portal, which we can absolutely get hold of. It's not always evident from the Microsoft portals themselves, but there's a lot of data behind that, which we grab. And we combine that and upload or ingest um, specific details about your contract with Microsoft. Um, so basically taking details from your customer pricing sheet, um, analyzing that and uploading that into the quantum platform. That almost allows us immediately to look at cost savings and, and, and optimization recommendations. And that may be across unassigned licenses, um, which is, it amazes me how many of these we find. Um, but these are effectively subscriptions that you have at your disposal which you haven't, or organizations haven't actually deployed or aligned to a user. Or they may have assigned um, those subscriptions to a particular user, um, but they've never been used. 
and therefore there's a great opportunity for 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 savings um and finally you know it's things about like where we can see that a user is not fully utilizing um the the subscription that's been um provided to them um and obviously you know we have an opportunity to downgrade or remove that subscription from the user as we move into azure very very similar hooking into all the um the azure billing portals um and um providing a set of reports and optimizations around um you know how we can drive down cost savings in that area um so if we look at windows that may be looking at how you can leverage um hybrid use benefits or where or what savings particular ris or reserved instances pre-purchase plans um can be um, utilized to reduce virtual machine costs um, in SQL, looking at, um, you know, once again, hybrid use benefits and leveraging perpetual licenses, which you may have access to, um, but equally looking at where we can utilize um, reserve capacity, um, along with analysis of vehicles versus DTU. Um, naturally, as Microsoft bring more and more pre-purchase um, type models to um, the market, um, we're also reviewing and helping customers understand what opportunities exist around um, saving uh, money around Databricks or Red Hat, SUSE, et cetera, and also reviewing cost opportunities, cost saving opportunities in the Azure marketplace. So it's quite extensive. Um, as with the 365 piece, it, it automates a lot of the cross charging components, breaking down subscriptions via departments, um, breaking them down by accounts or individual subscriptions. Um, all of that capability exists. Um, and naturally, one of the things that we're keen to talk to you guys about. Um, is you know how we could wrap a service around that, um, where we would effectively run these tools and, and diagnostics across your business, um, identify the cost savings, identify how that's going to impact your particular cloud strategy um, and your current contracts, and effectively either deliver that as an advisory service, where we're effectively producing a shopping list and a change, or recommending a set of changes to you guys, um, or indeed wrap that up as a full, fully managed service, where we take on board those changes and deliver them on your behalf. Um, the key thing there is making sure that we are always ensuring that your spend in Microsoft Cloud Services and online services um, is um, as efficient and as optimal as it um, can be, and that you're really leveraging the investments that you have to date. Um, one of the things that I encourage you to think about, um, and perhaps talk to your Bytes Account Manager about, um, is particularly on the 365 um, component, um, we're running a, a health check on behalf of customers where we can um, leverage this tool set, identify the possible or potential cost savings within your business. Um, we can help you look at um, you know, where what activities would be required to actually achieve those cost savings and deliver that as a succinct um, and timelined engagement, which we are delivering at no cost to our customers um, at this point in time. So if that sounds of interest, reach out to your BICE account manager um, who would happily talk you through what that looks like. Um, so that sort of brings our webinar to conclusion. Um, there is some time for some questions. If, if not, I'm not sure if there have been um, any put in, in, in um, into the uh, panel on the right-hand side. Um, obviously, um, I think we'll look at that in a moment. But just a reminder, um, if you do have any other questions, please do email tell me more at bias.co.uk. Great, thanks, Dan. Thank you very much for attending our webinar and uh, have a good day.